Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation, The Hobo CEO, A Year in the Life of a Dyslexic Social Entrepreneur. I'd like to first start by thanking Roger and his team for inviting me to come and talk to you today on my journey um, establishing the Dear Dyslexic Foundation. I'd like to first start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm meeting on tonight, which is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and to pay, pay my respects to elders, both past, present and emerging. I'm Shay Wassell and I am the CEO founder of the Dear Dyslexic Foundation. And I'm here today to talk to you about my journey establishing the foundation and um, which has led me to create the book, The Hobo CEO. Tonight, when I speak about um, the terms dyslexia and dysgraphia, I'm talking about specific learning disabilities, which is the umbrella term used in Australia. But as someone with both dyslexia and dysgraphia, they are the terms that I identify with. So throughout this presentation, I'll be using those terms. I originally trained as a speech pathologist and then I went on to do my master's in public health and health administration. And I'm currently doing my doctorate looking at uh, dyslexia in young people and adults in Australia. So looking at their social and emotional wellbeing and also their workplace experiences. I was diagnosed with dyslexia and dysgraphia at the age of 27. And uh, when I was diagnosed, there were no supports or services that I could access. And this really led me um, into a journey of uh, depression and anxiety and in and out of hospital because I really didn't have the supports in place um, to help me understand my diagnosis. And even trained as a speech pathologist, I really hadn't heard those terms before. So I felt like I'd really been left on my own to try and manage this um, disability that I now had. And so that uh, journey led me to establish the Dear Dyslexic Foundation in 2015. And in 2016, I formed a board and we're now a social enterprise registered um, and a registered charity. But sadly, my story uh, really is not an unfamiliar story within the Australian context particularly the challenges that young people and adults can face as they transition from school into the workplace or while they are um, working. Currently in Australia, there's little research that exists that really looks at um, how the link between low literacy and numeracy skills and dyslexia within the workplace. And there's been little research undertaken to look at the mental health and well-being of young people and adults who have dyslexia. Over the last few decades, we have seen um, an increase in awareness and understanding of dyslexia within the education system. And this has led to improved access to assessments and early interventions, although we're still quite a long way to go in the school sector. We haven't seen this translate at all into the workplace. Assessments to access a diagnosis and an assessment at the moment in Australia is very expensive and it really is out of reach and unaffordable for a lot of Australians. It's not covered under any government initiatives, nor is it um, supported under any social services uh, that are provided. So we have the National Disability Scheme in Australia, but dyslexia at the moment still isn't recognised under that National Disability Scheme, even though in 1992 it was um, recognised under the Disability Act, Discrimination Act. So we still have quite a long way to go in supporting children, young people and adults and really having it recognised as a formal disability where we need um, ongoing support throughout our life. What uh, research is really telling us uh, from overseas is that people with dyslexia can be significantly impacted when they're in the workplace. And as we move into the workplace, effective communication through different written mediums is really an essential criteria in um, how we manage in the workplace. And when people with dyslexia enter the workforce, many of them have to adapt to the complex and numerous demands that are placed on us with little support. So problems can include uh, managing day-to-day -day tasks or workloads, uh, needing to be reliant on a support person, whether that's a colleague or a family member, having to work back late 
or take work home to keep up with the demands of the workload that is put on us. And this is really because people aren't able to disclose at the moment or they're fearful of disclosing their dyslexia due to discrimination and possible um, stigma related to dyslexia. And this is uh, research coming out from overseas that strongly associates disclosure with that fear of discrimination and stigma. What's also challenging for people in the workplace is the actual workplace environment. So we're talking about background noise. A lot of offices now are open plans. So that can be really hard for us to manage and um, putting those assisted technologies in can be, can be challenging at times for people. Due to uh, COVID now, a lot of us are working from home. And so, you know, this shift for some people with dyslexia has been really helpful. For me, I really enjoy working from home where I've got that quiet, I don't have the background noise and I'm able to concentrate. But what I have noticed and what people have spoken about is now the increased demand on the written material. So we're communicating a lot more through email. We're doing a lot more written work. Uh, we have to adapt to a number of different platforms that have instant messaging. So again, you're constantly writing. Um, if you accidentally send enter, your message goes and you haven't had a chance to spell check it. And then you've got to go back and re-edit. So this all takes added time to our day-to-day -day activities we're already trying to manage working from home. So what we do know from research coming out from uh, international research at the moment is that the workplace stresses and life stresses can lead to those with dyslexia having um, poorer mental health and well-being. We have seen um, significant higher rates of anxiety and depression. So it's twice as likely if you're dyslexic to have anxiety and depression. But also what's uh, quite disturbing is that we're at higher rates of attempted suicide to up to 46% more likely to have attempted suicide compared to the rest of the population. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, I was one of those people in and out of hospital. So that 46%. And part of the reason um, the research is telling us is because people feel ashamed they feel embarrassed and they feel um, that they can't openly talk about their dyslexia. And I really love this quote from Brene Brown because she talks about the fact that, you know, shame can only rise so far in any system before people become disengaged to protect themselves. And when we're disengaged, we don't show up, we don't contribute and we stop caring about the most important thing in life, which is ourselves. And if you think about those with dyslexia, when they can't disclose or they can't seek help then and the system starts to fail them and they've got to protect themselves you can see how um, productivity can drop in the workplace people can start to develop poor mental health and well-being and they can really dis disengage and disconnect from education and the employment system leaving them really vulnerable to the environment around them whether it be work education and then general day-to-day -day life So my um, workplace experiences since I've been diagnosed with dyslexia have been challenging. Prior to being diagnosed with dyslexia, they were challenging. As since I've been diagnosed with dyslexia and dysgraphia, I've always disclosed to my employer that I've had uh, a learning disability because the fear of being caught out or being thought I was stupid or dumb like prior to being assessed um, creates so much more anxiety for me and um, distress that I'd rather be upfront. But for me, doing that has um, caused most of the time challenges in the workplace due to this lack of understanding and awareness. I've been micromanaged. I haven't been offered the salary advertised. I've been um, bullied and picked on in front of team members because of my writing. And you can really see the sheer frustration of managers when they are expecting you to be at this level that they don't think you're um, reaching. So the expectation as you progress in your career is that you're able to be a really strong, fluent writer. And when that um, your writing isn't meeting that need, it can really cause difficulties in the workplace. And even though I've openly disclosed my learning disability, I still um, have been bullied. And, you know, it takes a lot of effort to take an employer to uh, what we would call fair work over here because of bullying. And I can imagine like 
for me, you know, for many people, it's just not worth it. And you end up leaving that job because of the way you've been treated and you've got to start the process all over again. So it's really distressing and it can really impact on people's mental health and well-being. And this is a quote from my book, because when I um, started my journey around looking at how we could better support young people and adults with dyslexia, I really didn't realise that within the Australian context, there was this reading war going on around phonics and whole language and how we um, better support children through early assessments and early identification and interventions. And so I really talk about it as this warfare for me internally, because what I began to realise was that um, this war that was happening wasn't really something that I needed to be part of. And so it really began my journey looking at how we better support young people and adults across Australia and to give them a voice and to give them the opportunity to talk about their lived experience because our voice wasn't in the narrative. It was the voice of the parent, the specialist, the expert, uh, but the lived experience of young people and adults wasn't being heard. And so really for me, I felt like I was entering this new frontier of um, being able to not just use my own voice, but to give a platform for others to be able to share their voice as well. And so began uh, the story of the Dear Dyslexic Foundation, which I'm really excited to share with you today. It really started um, as a seedling of an idea. I was living in rural Victoria. It was about six hours from Melbourne where I was working and I was driving back and forth and I'd started listening to podcasts and um, I was listening to some from overseas and I realised that, you know, in Australia we didn't have anything like this. We didn't have a platform where people were coming and sharing their stories and um, really that's what we needed. And so the name Dear Dyslexic came about because what I realised was that I wanted to use oral storytelling to diarise our experiences and our journey throughout uh, adulthood around our dyslexia. So that seedling of an idea, uh, nearly five years later, the foundation I started in 2015, but formally in 2016, you know, four and a half years later, we are now a national uh, organisation. And our vision is to empower young people and adults with dyslexia and other learning disabilities to really be able to reach their full potential, whatever that potential is to them. And we do this in a number of ways. We raise awareness of dyslexia through direct action and education. We celebrate the stories of people's lived experience. And then we carry out research to ensure all the work we do is informed by evidence. So first off, why a not-for-profit slash grassroots uh, social enterprise? When I started the foundation, I uh, needed a platform to host the podcasts on. And that platform then became, I needed a website. So if I wanted to have a website, I wanted to make sure I had the most up-to-date resources and information on there. And then that slowly grew into um, offering services and support that really was lacking when I had been diagnosed. So support in tutoring for um, people, that peer support that I didn't get when I was diagnosed. I didn't know anyone that had dyslexia. I didn't realize that my dad was dyslexic, neither did he. We didn't know that my brother was, and that dyslexia has um, progressed throughout the generations. And my nephew now, uh, one of them has been diagnosed with dyslexia as well. So I wanted to have a platform that nationally we could support people. I didn't want to just be working in my state of Victoria, which is why I ended up um, registering the foundation as a charity. And we have charitable status, which means that we're able to raise funds through donations and um, through fundraising activities like our annual gala, and also that we could apply for a broader range of grants that could help us um, run the services and programs that we wanted to offer. And I also truly believe that not just one person can do this on their own, and that it takes a community uh, to create the change that we're trying to create right now. And I also knew I didn't have all the skills needed um, to be able to run a national organisation. 
And so it was really important to me that I was able to build a tribe or a community around me that um, had the same vision and mission and values, but who had the skills to help us continue to grow and grow as we have done over the last uh, four and a half years. And then recently we were endorsed uh, as a social enterprise. And so what that means is that we're able to not just have our um, fundraising and donation sector, but what we really want is a sustainable business that lasts um, you know, way into the future, that's continuing to support not just my nephew's generation, but the generations after him. And so by having a social enterprise, we're able to offer services where they're paid services, that then that money comes back into the foundation and we're able to use that to continue the business and also continue the, um, the peer support and the 1800 number and all the other activities we do that don't raise any funds. So the key areas that we work in, so raising awareness of dyslexia through direct action and education. So as I mentioned, we work um, supporting the individual, so the person that has dyslexia, and then we're also working with those working with people that have dyslexia. So whether it's educators, employers, health professionals. And so with our individual services, we provide assessments, we provide tutoring, peer support and our 1800 number. And our peer support is through a um, online once a month catch up that we run. We also have a closed Facebook community where people can come and join and ask questions. And uh, we also have a live um, Facebook session as well, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but also the 1800 number, which comes through to a peer. So people can talk to someone that has dyslexia and they're able to get a bit of that peer uh, support and guidance. The training we run prior to COVID was face to face, uh, but since COVID, like so many businesses, we've pivoted very quickly, long hours, long days, long nights, trying to get our face to face content online. And so now we run a series of webinars and uh, we'll be running um, in the next couple of months, boot camps as well. So short courses around a specific topic, whether it's supporting dyslexia in the workplace, understanding what neurodiversity is, um, understanding legislation. So really putting those um, upskilling managers, HR and those working and supporting people with dyslexia so they have a better understanding of what the needs are for their dyslexic employees or students. So celebrating the stories, we started with storytelling and this area has continued to grow and it's really part of that um, advocacy work that we undertake. So our Dear Dyslexic podcast series um, is now in its fourth year. We've had nearly 10,000 downloads, we've had 35 episodes and um, as this webinar goes out, we will have launched our 36th webinar. And the aim of these podcasts is really to share stories, not just to people that have dyslexia, people that are from, have a neurodiversity. We've got experts as well, giving tips on how to support people with dyslexia, particularly in the workplace. And uh, this has just grown from strength to strength. And I've just been blown away uh, by how much it's grown and the international following we now have. I remember when I launched our first one and I sat there with my mum thinking, saying to her, I don't think anybody is going to listen to these. I've wasted all this time. And day by day, month by month, the downloads have grown and grown. And, you know, it's just so exciting to see the reach we're having, not just within Australia, but around the world. Our question this series started uh, because of COVID, because we really wanted to be connecting as much as possible with our dyslexic community. They are a vulnerable group, particularly during this time. We have a lot of people that are self-employed, that work for them, that run their own businesses, that are artists, uh, creatives, and uh, they're really at risk of the impact of the closures that happened because of COVID. So we wanted to try and um, be able to reach out and connect to them as much as possible. So the question this series has a fellow dyslexic come on to talk about what they're currently doing, how they're managing during COVID and it's a live Facebook post and people are able to come and uh, ask questions if they'd like to around the topic that we're talking about. And from August, we're launching a mental health series as well. So once a month, we'll be talking about how to support your mental health and wellbeing and uh, some tips and strategies to do that, particularly during COVID. But as we are a community higher risk of mental health and wellbeing, it's really important 
that uh, we're putting out as many strategies and supports for our community. We also have a blog series. Uh, we teamed up with Ross Duncan, who's from Scotland, and he is our blog writer. And together we publish um, a blog once a month from people from all around the world. And Ross has been fantastic to work with. And it's really been encouraging to be able to work with people internationally around uh, how we grow a global community that's supporting people uh, with dyslexia. And you might think, oh, blog, that's reading. Our website has, uh, like many now, the function to read back. So everything on the website you can listen to. Uh, you don't have to read. Uh, and through our text-to-speech, it's in up to 40 languages as well. We also conduct research with La Trobe University. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm undertaking my doctorate. And this is the first of its kind research in Australia because everything we do, we want it to be informed by research. It's extremely important. And it's important that Australia starts to lead the way in some of the work that's happening across the country, not just uh, the work we do, but the work coming out around children and uh, adolescents as well. This is another excerpt from my book. When you realise that it's not you that needs to be repaired it's the world that needs fixing only then can you become your true authentic self and really uh, my journey to writing the hobo ceo has been about um, starting to really understand what that my disability meant for me and then um, how i'm able to not be ashamed or afraid to voice that i have a disability or i have a challenge and that i do need help sometimes uh, but, you know, we all need help. No one's perfect. We are all imperfect and we're always trying to improve. And I think that it's really important that, uh, particularly in the workplace, we realise that people come with many strengths, but also many challenges, regardless of whether you have a disability, a learning disability, uh, a mental health illness. You know, it doesn't matter. We all need support um, in different areas within the workplace. So that led me on a journey to write uh, my book called The Hobo CEO. And really it's a snapshot of a year in the life of what it's been like for me as um, a social entrepreneur and some of the trials and tribulations of running a business um, and also how you manage a learning disability while you're running a business and some of the difficulties that people may have because of it. So some of the key lessons I've learned throughout the last four years that I talk about in my book is really know your why and why are you um, running a not-for-profit or a social enterprise? Why are you wanting to work in this space of helping um, people, children that have dyslexia? And for me, my why has always been really strong. I've always wanted to serve others and I want to live my true authentic self. And I feel that um, the only way I could really be my true authentic self was actually by starting my own business where I didn't have to be afraid of um, saying I needed help. I didn't need to be afraid of recruiting team members where I knew we could all support each other's strengths, but also their challenges. And uh, I really wanted to make sure that the generations after me don't go through what the generations before me and currently what we're facing, particularly in the workplace. And then how that ripple effect impacts our whole lives and so for me my why has always been so strong since i started the foundation which is why i'm doing my doctorate i live and breathe dyslexia i think it can be quite boring sometimes for my partner because i'm constantly looking at new ways of doing things or having to spend time doing my research and i think that if you don't have that why and you don't know why you're doing it your business will fall over whether it's you know it doesn't matter what you're working in or what you, you start your business in. If you really don't have a grounded understanding of why you're doing it, um, nothing will fall into place for you. I think also one of the important things is how we've started to shift the narrative through storytelling. And I've spoken a lot about the podcast tonight, but it really is around opening up the floor for a variety of people to be able to share their stories because we all have a story, we all have a lived experience. And um, I feel for too long, those with dyslexia have had to hide and their voices haven't been heard and they haven't been able to stand up and say, I'm proudly dyslexic, I'm a dyslexic 
warrior or you know some people I talk to talk about wearing their dyslexia as a badge of honor and you know sadly for many people in Australia they just don't feel that it's a badge of honor they don't feel that it's a strength or it's um, a superpower they feel that the world currently is disabling them and they're not able to achieve because the world around them just doesn't understand how to accommodate them so they can achieve so it's really important around changing the narrative and shifting um, the language and the understanding around dyslexia. And so this book really talks about how you do that, but also um, the theory or the technical side of actually how do you set up a podcast? When I first started, I was so naive to it. And I think if I had understood uh, how much work was involved in establishing a podcast, I may not have done it. And so you know, listening to three podcasts and deciding that's it, I'm going to do one may sound quite crazy, but um, sometimes you just have to dive in and that's not business advice. That's my own personal advice around sometimes if you know too much the detail, then you may be put off. And so for me, it was a trial and error in learning, you know, what platform did I use? You know, how long did I interview people? How did I find people? How do you market those podcasts and start sharing those stories? And so the, my book really talks about how you do some of that day-to-day -day work and um, developing and then showcasing your podcasts. Also, before I mentioned uh, why I wanted to start a foundation and a not-for-profit rather than a for-profit, and I talked about the importance of building your community around you because you can't know everything and um, you shouldn't know everything. And really, you need other people. You don't want to be in a groupthink situation or that you think you know everything because we don't. And by bringing other people on board um, really helps to be able to network and to grow your business, which is why it's really important. That was why it was really important for me to have a board. Um, and each time we've had new board members on, they've brought, they've brought along with them new strengths, new skills, new networks that have enabled the foundation to take the next steps forward in growing as a business. So moving kind of from that startup phase, now we're starting to look at how we scale up some of our activities. And so for me, it's been really important. And one of the reasons I sit on the board, which isn't so common, is because the foundation was my, my business to start with. I've remained on the board. I, um, there's certain things I don't vote on, if particularly if it's my own idea, I won't vote on it. Um, the board has to vote on it. And uh, you know, in the book, I talk about some of the risks where the board could kick me off. Um, and then I would not be the CEO of the foundation anymore, but also the strategies you put in place to make sure that you know that doesn't occur and that you're having that open dialogue ongoing with your board members around your vision and your mission and what you're really wanting to achieve for the business and for the community that you're serving. One of, I think, the most uh, important chapters is around money and particularly. Um, you know, when people start off in business, particularly women, 50% of women don't get paid or aren't paying themselves. And um, for me, it was important to talk about money so that we're not scared of it, that we need to understand it. And uh, for someone that has dyslexia and dysgraphia, uh, my maths is quite impaired, even though I don't have dyscalculia. I really quite struggle with maths. I've struggled uh, managing my finances day to day. And so when I established the foundation, initially it wasn't about making money or how do we manage money. It was, I just want to share stories and I just want to do podcasts and I want to change the world through doing that. But uh, as we grew into this business, I really had to start learning more and more around understanding the finances, even though I'd studied finance at university through my management course, you know, putting that theory into practice can be quite challenging. And so as someone that's dyslexic, does, doesn't read things properly, making sure I've had the right people in place to help me so that we can grow the finances, we manage it well. And as a not-for-profit, we're extremely accountable to, um, to the governing body, so the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission. And so we have to make sure that our finances are um, in check all the time. And so this chapter really talks about trying to remove the fear of um, money and to remove the, 
the cloak of silence that people have around money, not wanting to talk about how much they're making, not talk about how much they're not making, uh, particularly as a startup, you know, we're not making much money. And one of the um, really strong values of being a not-for-profit is being able to get that financial support from our donors and from our fundraising to help us with those operational funds that are really hard at the beginning of a startup. And unless you're taking out money uh, against your business, you know, then it's really, you've got to look at alternative funding streams. And so for me, having a board, having um, that fundraising capacity has been really important, but also having a really good understanding of where the money's coming from, where it's going out. But I think most importantly, how to explain it to the board, because you're telling a story around the finances and that can be quite challenging sometimes. So the chapter really talks about who are the key people that you need to get in to help you um, manage your books and to be able to talk about um, money, particularly when you're uh, meeting with your board. And then I think one of my favorite chapters is the coach, mentor, and the psychologist. Um, since I've started the foundation, I've always talked about mental health and well-being. And originally it was around my mental health and well-being, but as we've progressed, I've really um, come to see that the impact of dyslexia on so many people's mental health and well-being is significant. And so this chapter was really talking about as a business, it's really important to find a coach. And at one point I had a business coach, I had a mentor for the business, and then I had my psychologist. And those three people were really key in helping me progress the business. Um, my business coach really helped me start to understand the structures of money and what structures I need to put in place. My mentor helped me working through some of the challenges of having a board, having the challenges around a social enterprise and a startup and how you go and find money, how you go and find support and grow your networks. And then my psychologist who I've had uh, for so long now, I can't even remember, is really around that checking in. So balancing your work, study, life, commitments, uh, keeping your mental health and well-being in check making sure that um, you're exercising, you're seeing your family, you're doing all those important things. And so this chapter really talks about, you know, how do you manage when you've got all these different opinions coming at you all the time and how do you um, put those structures in place so that you're taking in information, you're using it um, as and when needed and that you're staying mentally uh, strong and physically strong as well. So there's some of the key learnings out of my book and I'm really excited that um, it will be launching on the 1st of October in line with National Dyslexic Awareness Month. And every dollar raised um, will be donated to the foundation to help us keep going in the work that we're doing. So that uh, if you'd like to pre-order your book now, you can go to www.shaymarie.com.au. And you can also find out more information around the Dear Dyslexic Foundation and all the work we're doing at deardyslexic.com. So I really hope that um, today's webinar has given you in some insights into how we set up the foundation, um, the why around why we set it up, and then some of the different things you need to think about when you're looking at starting a business or a not-for-profit, um, the reasons why you might go for a for-profit or a not-for-profit, and really the importance of building that tribe and that community because we can't do it on our own. We shouldn't do it on our own. And we really need the support of everybody so we can start changing the narrative, not just within Australia, but across the world. So we really can show the strengths of those that have dyslexia, not just the challenges and how together we are so much stronger than if we are alone. So I thank you so much for uh, coming to listen to this webinar and please send me an email or head to our websites if you uh, want any further information. Thank you again to Roger and his team for having me and all the best to everyone else that's presenting at the conference. I'm really, really so pleased I've had this opportunity to share what we're doing in Australia. So thank you all and goodbye. <laughs>